What's up, people? Welcome back to week two. Uh, I want to try this again. This is the second time I'm recording part two to week two. That's all right, though. Uh, we have plenty of time. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get into it. Um, I'm going to pick up where I left off before with the PowerPoint. And we're going to begin with... So the end of, of uh, during lecture one of week two, discussed modes of writing and talked about narrative, uh, narrative example, definition, exemplification, okay? And so um, with this lecture, we're going to begin talking about theme, audience, and tone. Because the work that you're doing this week directly relates to this information. The main assignment um, deals with thinking about audience and theme and tone. Okay. So let's talk about theme. A theme is the universal message that a literary text conveys. And a literary text can be really anything. Uh, it, it can be you know, a definitely a book a short story, a poem, but can also be film and TV shows. These are all literary pieces. It's different from a summary, which tells the main events of a text. And like theme is not conveyed by uh, someone who's speaking directly at us. Theme has to be interpreted. Okay. Um, it's also not a word or a topic. Um, a, a book might have a thematic topic like war, but theme is uh, looking at what does that book say about war? What truths uh, is the author trying to say about war? And sometimes the themes are, uh, it's almost a paradox. They're, they're, they seem contradictory. There can be two themes that are almost opposite that um, a um, literary piece is trying to convey, uh, which can both be true. So like for war, let's just say, okay? Um, like the book, uh, Cold Mountain. Um, that has two conflicting, uh, many conflicting themes dealing with war. Sometimes it's how war corrupts. War uh, kills the inner souls of soldiers uh, after they have to commit such heinous acts. But then also, uh, war can strengthen people. War can make people more um, independent and um, and uh, stronger. So you know, like there's both positive and negative themes of the same topic in a text, and it's all based upon you know storylines, what's happening around those characters. So like y'all read just walk on by. And so he never comes out direct. I mean, there are times where he, he does come out and say things directly about uh, what this is about. Um, but then other times it's implied. And so the theme of Just Walk On By is Black men are often falsely assumed to be violent predators, which ironically places themselves in, you know, even more actual danger. All right. It's that, uh, it's that main idea, that main sort of... Um, I don't want to, I hate calling it a lesson because sometimes we think of lesson is always like a good thing, but sometimes it's not a lesson. Sometimes, sometimes it's an observation about life um, that's made by the text. It's something that we can take away. It's almost like as if theme looks at, at all stories as being a metaphor, a big giant metaphor, an allegory, um, a, a, a story that's used to teach some sort of knowledge or information or perspective about life. And it's not always a positive or good one. Okay, so then we have the audience of a piece. Understanding the intended audience of a piece of writing determines many factors on how something is written. We all communicate differently to people um, that we are speaking to. I know that like I talk to my wife differently than I talk to my children as I should. Um, it would be very patronizing if I speak to my wife, misogynistic, if I speak to her the way I speak to our children. Uh, 
It also, if I try to explain to my kids uh, things that in, in a way that in which I would, I would talk to my wife about, it would be completely over their head and they wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't get it. So audience matters. And, you know, we all like, as I think when we were younger, we talked to our parents differently than we spoke to our friends. I guess we still do that. <laughs> Some pieces are written for audiences who already believe or relate to the writer of the topic. And some pieces are written for skeptical audiences. And some pieces are for a general audience. So, you know, it's, um, uh, I can read books that, let's see here. So there's this book called All the Rage. And it is, it's a book written about uh, the presumed idea of, equality in marriages um and the book is written is intended to be read pretty much um by people who generally believe in equality and um and like uh egalitarian in um relationships where people have equal partnership okay um, not in necessarily more conservative traditional mar marriages where they, you know, where they have, they, have, they have very defined gender roles. Okay, but it's written for people who think that they're in more progressive relationships, and then it reveals that all these people who, who often think that they're in these more balanced, equal partnerships in their marriages, are they still actually subconsciously revert back to tr to traditional gender norms where women taking on the heavy burden of the household duties. And so uh, the, uh, the book is not trying to convince people who believe in gender roles uh, that they should break those. Instead, it's for the people who, who think that they're being very progressive and it turns out they're not being that progressive. So if they really want to be, if they really want to have a more modern, balanced uh, relationship, then they need to do more. So the, it's it's not trying to convert people. It's trying to open the eyes of people who already think they've been converted, but actually they haven't been. Uh, so for some examples in terms of media, we have like Fox News. They write their articles for people who already identify as conservatives. Uh, they're not trying to convert Democrats. If a Democrat went to Fox News to read their articles, they wouldn't be like, oh yeah, these are good points. They would feel insulted. They would feel insulted. Uh, it is uh, a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a news group that really sticks to their base and writes to the, the audience that they already have, not trying necessarily to, to get new ones. But then you have like Newsweek, and like Newsweek articles are about different political topics and of different parties, offering criticism and praises for both sides. So the audience is a rather moderate, broad group of readers. Um, they do try to inform people so that way um, and help people understand what's happening politically and what's going on, okay? And then there's like Rolling Stone magazine and, you know, they, they print more damning articles criticizing conservative republicans they are not trying to convert people uh they're not trying to convert republicans okay and so uh they are pretty one-sided as well they they know their audience also so the same way in which fox news is not trying to necessarily convert democrats they're just uh, uh writing to their base Rolling Stone kind of does, you know, some, some similar stuff as well, okay? All right, tone. Well, on, let me see if there's anything else I want to say about audience. Uh, you know, um, yeah, so so audience really is, the well, final thing is, is that, like, you can get an idea of, of by either how specific or how, um, Okay, so like for example, I, I read this uh, book called oh, what's it called? Uh, Black Space. It's 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 written by um, a the writer is a is she's one of the only very few only black female um, like new uh, 
nuclear scientists. And so um, she writes about being uh, about being a black woman in the science field. And um, she really writes a lot for, I think, scientists, because I'm, I'm reading when I read her stuff. Um, it's uh, there are times where she's talking about just, you know, you know, her experiences of being a woman, her experiences of of, of addressing or facing um, racism and stuff. And then she gets really deep into like neutrons and protons and space and woo, it goes, it goes way over my head in terms of the science and the science that, 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 that she discusses and stuff. And so um, I think that there's a lot of people who are, who are in the science field who will find that very fascinating and interesting. Um, but for me, it does just go kind of like, way over uh my head all right in terms of all of that so audience does impact how things are written and how things are perceived tone tone is the author's own attitude toward the subject matter often an author's tone is described by adjectives such as cynical depressed sympathetic sometimes it's, it's ironic or sarcastic, or excited, or intense, or outraged. Um, tone is the way in which, like, movie directors, they'll direct their films with a certain tone to it to convey their beliefs on the subject matter as well. They'll make some things seem more sympathetic, while they'll make other actions seem more, uh, you know, critical or horrific. And that's, that's, that reveals a lot of their own uh, attitudes towards the subject. Some people try to have a very neutral tone. So like if we go back to uh, this, uh, Fox News has a very um, um, critical, sarcastic, at times, um, negative tone towards Democrats. Rolling Stone often um, has very critical, damning tones towards Republicans. And then Newsweek tries to write in a way in which uh, the author is not taking a side. They're just trying to present things um, as balanced as they can. So there's almost like a, a non-tone. I think you'd call it an objective tone, um, but a lot of people just see it as in there's no tone at all. Uh, it's not an action, it's an attitude. It's the word choices. You, you understand it through the way that, that the writer speaks about the subject matter. Okay, it's how they're talking about it. Two people can report on the same story, yet we're using completely different tones. Um, it's not explained or expressed directly. Again, it's, it's through mostly through word choice. So, so therefore, a reader must read between the lines to feel the author's attitude and identify the tone. Tone impacts the mood, which is the emotion the author wants the readers to feel while reading about the subjects. Tone is inspired by the audience that the piece is intended for. Okay. Sometimes. Now, sometimes the audience is the writer, his or herself. Okay. So sometimes the writer just wants to write something that he or she would, in, or they would enjoy. And so like the way they perceive themselves is the audience that they're trying to write for anyone who identifies like them. And so they try to write with a lot of voice and with a lot of personality. And, uh, and sometimes the tone or sometimes that's also referred to as conversational. The tone is conversational and they want it to be as if they're talking to anybody. And so they're just like a real person. So they might try to make it less formal. To give you an example of this, we're going to look, we're going to look at an excerpt from Lone Survivor uh, and American Sniper. So these are both books. These are both war memoirs set during the same conflict with the same opponent, post 9-11, Middle East, and they're both by Navy SEALs, okay? Uh, Lone Survival is by Marcus Luttrell, who is this dude on the left with the goatee. That's Marky Mark, who plays him in the movie. And there's American Sniper by Chris Kyle, and that's Chris Kyle. Both Marcus and Chris are Navy SEALs. 
They both fought in the Middle East. They both fought post 9-11. They have a lot in common in that way. All right. Now they've fought in different parts of the Middle East. All right. And I'm not at all trying to be like one of those people who are like, oh, it's all the same. No, Europe is not all the same. France, Germany are very different. Over here, North America is not, is not all the same. Canada is not the same as America. Even in America, I mean, Georgia is not the same as like California. So I am not saying that that Marcus and Chris have the exact same experience fighting in the Middle East because the Middle East is made up of many countries that are different okay but um in terms of them both being american navy seals fighting in a foreign land with a very different culture than from what they're used to and then they write their memoirs uh and their reflections about that time all right so we're going to read how they describe just, just an excerpt from each of their books, how they describe um, their opponent differently, okay? So here we go. Let's look at this. This is an excerpt from Lone Survival, Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell. And I'm going to highlight tone words, okay? I'm going to read it, and I'm going to highlight words that reveal his tone. All right, here we go. I ought to mention the Pashtuns, the world's oldest living tribal group. There are about 42 million of them. 28 million live in Pakistan, and 12.5 million of them live in Afghanistan. That's 42% of the entire population. There are about 88,000 living in Britain and 44,000 in the USA. In Afghanistan, they live primarily in the mountains of the Northeast, and they also have heavily populated areas in the East and South. They are a proud people who adhere to Islam and live by a strict code of honor and culture, observing rules and laws known as Pashtunwali, which has kept them straight for 2,000 years. They're also the quintessential supporters of the Taliban. Their warriors form the backbone of the Taliban forces. And their families grant those forces shelter in high mountain villages, protecting them and providing refuge in places that would appear almost inaccessible to the Western eye. Now, that does, does not include U.S. Navy SEALs, who do have Western eyes, but who don't do inaccessible. We can get in anywhere. It's easy to see why the Pashtuns and the Taliban, the Taliban get along just fine. The Pashtuns were the tribe who refused to buckle under the army of the Soviet Union. They just kept fighting. In the 19th century, they fought the British to, ver uh, to the verge of surrender and then drove them back into Pakistan. 300 years before that, they wiped out the army of Akbar the Great, the most fierce of, Indian of India's Mughal rulers. Those passions are, prou are proud of their stern military heritage. And it's worth remembering that in all the centuries of bitter, savage warfare and Balakustan, I don't know if I said that right, sorry, during which time they were never subdued. Half the population was always Pashtun. The concept of tribal heritage is very rigid. It involves bloodlines, amazing lineages that stretch back through the centuries, generation after generation. You can't join a tribe in the way you can become an American citizen. Tribes don't hand out green cards or passports. You either are or you aren't. Language, traditions, customs, and culture play a part. But I repeat, you can't join the passions. And that gives them all a steel rod of dignity and self-esteem. Their villages may not be straightforward military strongholds as the Taliban, Taliban desire, but the passions are not easily intimidated. All right. So if we read through this, okay, and we read through the lines, we can see that Marcus Luttrell, he highly respects the passions. Uh, yes, he, he fought them. You know, but like there's a lot of people who believe that just because you fight someone, just because someone is your enemy doesn't mean that like you, you don't respect them. I mean, and there's so many films about this. Uh, uh, Gangs of New York is a classic film about about how two men, enemies, the priest and the butcher and they lead forces against each other. Yet the butcher loved the priest. He like 
so highly respected him and wanted to be like him, even though he murdered him, you know, they fought, you know, he even said it, it was the last honorable man he killed. So the butcher said, sorry if I spoiled it for you. It's an old movie. So many stories are about how people respect, still have respect for their enemies. Okay. But they still have to fight though. And so here you have Marcus who clearly, I mean, he talks about, you know, how there are proud people and like all these things that I highlighted are things that like many Americans uh, value within themselves. All right. Uh, whether these are good things or bad things. Okay. But like many Americans uh, push themselves or present themselves as proud people. America is all about patriotism. All right. And to have like honor in the American culture. And we're a country of, of law and order, rules and laws uh, to keep people on the straight and narrow. All right. I mean, these are these are pretty traditional American values. Uh, America likes to pride itself as being like a warrior nation as well. Strong army, strong sports, fighting spirit. Um, America refused also to buckle under under the the government of the Soviet Union. I mean, like for 50 years, we had the Cold War in which America damned Russia. And still today, you know, we have a lot of very negative associations to Russia. And so uh, just as the passions fought the Russians, so did we. Uh, the passions also fought the British. And, you know, we celebrate every year, July 4th, our fight against the British for our independence. I mean, the two main people that they picked here are the two main people that I think goes down in American history as being um, our rivals. The Soviets, presently, and in the past, it was England. You know, now we're cool with England, but like, People still, you know, we're cool with England now. It's still very American to be like, you know, we fought the British and we got our independence and here we are. Um, they're proud of their stern military heritage. America is very proud of its military heritage as well. Amazing lineages. I mean, that's a, he's literally praising the, this line of people. And then he goes into this whole thing about how like, you're just you're born this way. You can't you you can't just get a green card or passport. To me, I read this as very much uh, that he also has this sort of like proud, born free, born American, and he he respects that about the passions. Where like you can't just become a you just can't become a passion. All right, you had to be born that way. And uh, in America, you know, there's a lot of people. Which, I mean, I'm not accused, I don't know this guy, you know, but, like, to me, uh, he seems to really respect this idea that, that you're born a certain way rather than, like, getting it through paperwork. Um, he says, you know, it gives him a steel rod of dignity and self-esteem. Uh, again, that, that's, that, that's phrased in a way that where he respects that they have this, like, this self-esteem, this dignity that they're, they're proud. I mean, I think this, this also pushed this idea of like American strength and patriotism and having dignity and proud of yourself, proud to serve. Okay. And the passions are not easily intimidated. So like, these are all, I think, very strong core values that I think a lot of Americans have. And I think that Marcus Luttrell has these, and I think he's showing respect towards these people that are of a different culture, of a different religion, of a, of, a, of a different ethnic background, yet he sees how they are still, they still hold a lot of the characteristics that at least he sees are honorable in Americans as well, okay? Now, all of that, of course, is, is, is read through the lines. I'm just, in, I'm trying to interpret his tone uh, towards these people based upon what he's written and how that reflects upon him. Okay. All right. Then we have Amer we have American Sniper by Chris Kyle, and here's Chris Kyle's description of while it's not the same exact people because he's in Iraq, all right, but he is still um, a American fighting in the Middle East against a, a native group of people who inhabit the area in which America has now taken place. Okay. Here we go. Savage despicable evil that's what we were fighting in iraq that's why a lot of people myself included called the enemy savages there really was no other way to describe what we encountered there people ask me all the time how many people have you killed 
My standard response, does the answer make me less or more of a man? The number is not important to me. I only wish I had killed more. Not for breaking rights, but because I believe the world, the world is a better place without savages out there taking American lives. Everyone I shot in Iraq was trying to harm Americans or Iraqis loyal to the new government. I had a job to do as a SEAL. I killed the enemy, an enemy I saw day in, day out, plotting to kill my fellow Americans. I'm haunted by the enemy's successes. There were few, but even a single American life is one too many lost. People say you have to dis distance yourself from your enemy to kill him. If that's true, in Iraq, the insurgents made it really easy. The fanatics we fought valued nothing but their twisted interpretation of religion. And half the time, they just claimed they valued their religion. Most didn't even pray. Uh, quite a number were drugged up so they could fight us. Many insurgents were cowards. They routinely used drugs to stoke their courage. Without them alone, they they were nothing. Okay. Um, so this clearly reveals his attitude towards uh, these uh, Iraqi soldiers who were also Taliban fighters. Okay. Uh, they were evil. They were savages. Uh, he wanted to kill more. Uh, he repeats that they're enemy. They're, he's haunted by them, meaning as if, you know, given this idea that they are monsters, they're fanatics, they're twisted. Okay. Uh, and like, you know, America is a country in which we pray and they did not pray. And so they're unholy. Again, they're cowards. They were nothing. So here, Chris Kyle shows zero respect for the people that he fought. Okay. And of course, look, Chris Kyle might have a very different experience than Marcus Luttrell. Okay. Even though Marcus Luttrell was being hunted down and trying to be, I mean, his book is literally, literally called Lone Survivor because his whole group was killed off, picked off one by one by these people, you know, like all of his friends were still killed by the Pashtuns. All right. So, uh, you know, but I mean, who knows, you know, maybe, maybe Marcus Luttrell, maybe he was, um, maybe he was uh, radicalized. Maybe if you saw that, you know, if you saw that show, what was that show on Showtime with Claire Danes? About the about the uh, the uh, Iraqi War veteran who uh, who who was uh, held captive, um, and uh, eventually he converted to Islam and secretly uh, secretly and then came back to America to like work for to be a double agent, whatever. Maybe Marcus Luttrell, Homeland, Homeland. Maybe Marcus Luttrell had a Homeland experience, and he actually uh, is the only survivor because. He, he, he gave in. I'm not going to claim that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take this from the perspective that he is just a soldier who uh, tried to stay objective between, like, you know, his duty. And he understands why these people would not want him in, in their country and why they would fight back. But he still had a job to do. And, like, that was it. Um, versus Chris Kyle, who had an emotional had an emotional reaction to these people and he was actually uh guided a lot by his hatred and um and also at the same time you know listen though maybe chris kyle had to convince himself that these people were evil in order for him to you know he, he never admits about feeling guilty about killing people i mean you know we are all moved uh by uh our deep subconscious feelings and we try to rationalize and come up with these logical explanations for why we feel or don't feel a certain way. And also there's a, you know, a lot of, a lot of people like to displace their feelings. They, they like to, they may feel a certain way about something, but they don't want to admit that they feel that way. So they try to rationalize it. So maybe Chris Kyle, deep down, he felt guilty, maybe deep down. I mean, we don't know because he died. Um, spoiler, if you didn't know that, but he doesn't die in the book. Um, but that, you know, maybe deep down he felt guilty. Maybe he felt that, like, um, that maybe killing people was wrong. So instead, if he if he convinces himself in his head that they're evil, they're savages, they're awful, then that takes away his natural feelings of, of guilt. You know, maybe. I don't know. Again, we're all, it's just, this is all interpretations. All we get is what they give us. And then we have to dive deeper in, into that. And maybe our interpretations are wrong, and that's fine if, if they're wrong, um, as long as they're they were made honestly based upon the context of what 
you know, be read. So interpret this however you want to. Okay. But, um, you know, we use context clues to tell us to lead us into our interpretation. So I interpret Marcus Luttrell as being respectful to his enemy and finding a lot of ways in which he relates to his enemy, yet still having to, you know, do the job that he was told to do. And he seems to be non-emotional about it. While Chris Kyle seems very emotional about uh, the people that he's fighting, he has a very negative outlook on them. And to the point where it, to me, it seems like he, he does that in order to make it easier on himself to kill them. Okay. All right. So isn't that interesting that, anyways, yes. So that's sort of, you know, tone, theme, looking at, looking at you know, our analysis, our audience here, maybe, okay. Audience for Marcus Luttrell's might be uh, people who uh, didn't necessarily support the war, but wanted to know more about it. People who might be sympathetic to um, some of the people in the Middle East who felt like they were being invaded, right? Uh, he might also be trying to talk to people who um, might have had a very negative outlook on uh, or judgmental towards soldiers. And so he's like, look, you know, I can, you can be very objective and respectful. He's still have a job to do. While like American sniper Chris Kyle, his audience might be more like people like himself. He might be his own audience where, uh, it, where you uh, abrasive, uh, dominant, uh, his idea of patriotism, justification for his, uh, he might be speaking to his, um, to his critics the people who are critical to direct war, he wants to tell them, you know, you're stupid feeling that way because these people are terrible people. All right. There's all the different ways in which we can interpret the audience. And that's the thing about also, like, with this work this week, your inter I don't have to agree with your interpretation as long as you have reasonings for justif to justify your interpretation. I don't have to have had this. In fact, I love it when, when people write things about the way that they interpret work in a way that I didn't see it. Okay. So the great thing about writing about stuff that's not directly stated is that uh, you, one can't really say it's wrong as long as you have support and explanation for it. All right, homework this week. All that is because of our homework. You are, if you uh, read chapter two of your textbook, Invention, uh, you're reading To Keep It Holy from Educated by Tara Westover, this lady. You're reading Go Hitler from Born a Crime by this dude. And you're completing the tone analysis assignment and the memoir form. And I will show you where those are. Okay, so this is our announcements. This is our page. Weekly lessons. Let's go to week two. So here is the work, okay? Here is uh, the Tara Westover document to keep it holy. This, this is an, a chapter from, from her book, um, Educated, which is one of the memoirs you could have chosen to read. If you like this piece right here, you can choose to read her whole entire memoir. And, and I think I have a PDF copy of it. Yeah, that's where I got this from. If you want a PDF copy of the, of, of the whole memoir, um, send me an email and I will... Uh, send it to you. Okay. So this is the chapter that you're going to read. Tara Westover was, um, she, I don't know if I told y'all this. I feel like we, oh, no, no, I, we did, I did not. So Tara Westover is, um, she was born and raised by some pretty fundamentalist Mormons up in the, in the mountains of Idaho where her parents homeschooled her. And then, um, when she gets, to be college age, she, cho she chooses to go to Brigham Young University. And her parents don't want her to go. They object to it, but she goes anyways. And it's the first time ever being in a public school, which is in college, right? And so this this this, this chapter is about her uh, making a, a, you know, realizing that maybe even though she was homeschooled, she wasn't taught everything that she should have been taught, okay? Go Hitler by Trevor Noah. This one 
is a chapter from his uh, childhood in uh, or his teenage years in uh, South Africa under apartheid. Okay, this one's a little bit longer. All right, you're gonna read that one as well, and then you have this analysis, the assignment to do. All right, so you gotta do the following. View the portion of the week two lecture that addresses tone and audience, which we're doing right now. Read to keep it holy, which I just talked about. Hitler, go Hitler, read that one, and review the MLA notes again. So on a correctly formatted MLA documents, you are going to write three paragraphs discussing both readings. Each paragraph is about both readings. You're going to talk about Tara and Noah in, in every single paragraph, all right? Each paragraph needs to be organized in the manner I taught in week one, claim, support, analysis. And then we have the breakdowns of each of each of the three paragraphs. Paragraph one, come up with a common theme on education that both selections share, but discuss how their shared theme is directed at different audiences. Okay, so say after reading educated and after reading go Hitler, Figure out like what's a common, what's one theme that they both have in common, okay? This one theme, this one kind of message relates to both pieces, but how that theme is speaking to different audiences. So there's a similarity, similarity in theme, but the difference is in the audiences. While they both share this theme, Noah's audience is more like these people, while Tara's audience is more like these people. And there's no real right or wrong answer. All it is, is you explaining it. Okay, I don't have one in mind. I Now, whenever I create this work, I always have what would be my response. Because if, if I can't come up with a response, how can I expect you to come up with a response? So I, I always have one in mind. But like, you can come up with your own that's enlightening to me, okay? This is all about communication. It's not about whether or not you're correct or not. I don't know if you're correct or not. If, you're, if your argument is convincing, then you're correct. Paragraph two, contrast the differences of tone in the two pieces. How does the tone of each story support the theme of the stories, okay? Now, they do have a common theme, but Tara's tone is very different than, than Trevor Noah's tone, okay? And then talk about how those relate to the theme, all right, the tone. Tara's is more serious, Noah is more silly. Paragraph three, which of these selections is more of a narrative and which of these selections is more of an, ex of an exemplary essay, okay? All right, um, make sure it's in MLA formatting. I'll be grading you on proper MLA formatting, all right? And by correct analysis of the essays, meaning that like you, that your analysis is supported by your support and your claim. I don't, I'm not so much about like whether it's the right interpretation. I'm writing about your analysis. Do you have a claim? Do you have support? And do you have an explanation? And all of those add up and they all support each other. Your, your, I don't, you know, your support can't contradict your analysis and your analysis can't contradict your claim. It all has to fit in together. Okay. And as long as they all flow, then you're good. I, I don't have to agree with you, but I have to say that there's a thing called like lo a logically sound argument. Okay. Logically sound arguments don't have to be correct, but they have to be set up correctly. Like the conclusion of a logically sound argument could end up being false. As long as, as long as the claim and the evidence and the analysis all go together, even if it turns out technically to be scientifically or whatever wrong. Okay, so there's that. Do all that, okay? Do all that. Then you also have this memoir form that you gotta fill out and it's for a grade. What is your first and last name? What is the name of the memoir you are reading? Who is the author of the book? And then this and this. This is for a grade, okay? I wanna make sure everyone has picked a memoir, all right? If you read either to keep it holy 
uh, or Go Hitler, and you're like, wow, those are really good chapters. I want to read the entire book. Then um, you can pick those. Like, like I said, I think I, I have a copy of Educated. Ooh, let's see here. Educated. Um, I believe I do. And that I can send you. And uh, if I don't think I have a cult, and then I think I have a whole copy also of. Um, and I think I might have a whole copy of Trevor Noah's book on PDF as well. If you want to read either of those, uh, the entire thing, send me a email and I'll, I'll look for those. Okay. I can, I can, I can post the PDFs those. So yeah. All right. So that's, that's what we're doing this week. All right. Um, I hope this was uh, helpful. I hope I recorded this correctly because I don't want to record this for a third time. Okay. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I will check y'all later.